So good morning or good afternoon everyone and welcome to this session, a session which focuses on investment, um, investment in Asia and our title is Being Bold About Asian Private Investment Risks. Ladies and gentlemen, we have two distinguished speakers with us uh, from different Asian contexts. I'd like to introduce them very briefly and then we'll go straight into the topic and dig more deeply into it. Firstly, um, from Japan, we have Mr. Haru Haruku Onishi, who has uh, a background in venture capital. He is the CEO of the technology seed incubation company in Japan, and they provide investment and commercialization support for startups. And basically startups as an incubator, and also for those wishing to enter and get into, into, into Japan and go the other way out of Japan. Secondly, um, from Singapore, uh, I'd like to introduce Leon To. He is the executive director of Dams and Capital. And an impact in Dams and Capital is an impact investment and advisory for firm, and they focus on developing social enterprises in Asia and with a strong potential for impact in communities in need. So um, as well as focusing on sustained financial return, returns. So Leon's based in Singapore, but has a vast amount of experience in other Asian contexts. And um, he's also active on a number of advisory boards and has significant experience in um, long-term impact investment, which we'll touch on today, and also smart solutions. So ladies and gentlemen, our two panelists. Um, first of all, I'd just like to, my name is Peter Perrett. I'm a professor here in Switzerland, where it's still early morning. Um, I'm a, a lecturer and researcher here at the University of Applied Sciences, Northwestern Switzerland. So let's have a look at this topic um, we're focusing on being bold about Asian private investment risks. And we all know that the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in significant lockdowns um, and in fact caused probably the worst recent economic recession the world has witnessed. And we've had disruption in recent, uh, we've had recent disruptions in global supply chains which has prompted many Asian nations to increase infrastructure investments and to aid the growth in technology and entrepreneurship. And I was just reading a recent Swiss re-report which suggested that emerging Asia will continue to be where most new infrastructure is built. So big ticket infrastructure items that all countries in Asia will need to invest in to maintain the growth momentum to tackle things like poverty and climate change. But we know the road ahead will be challenging and the price tag is high. And the pandemic has been really bruising for economies and particularly for the most vulnerable, including those on low incomes and women. And the need to, in, in, to fund infrastructure is really growing at the same time as government coffers are being completed. So I'd like to actually now turn to our first panelist. Um, and I'd like to start off with you, Leon. Um, could you basically um, tell us, um, considering your experience in impact investment and managing director, um, can you consider how investors can be guided effectively under consideration of Asian regulations? For example, also how your organization supports them in that respect. Over to you, Leon. Well, thank you so much, Peter. Um, it, it's, it's a pleasure to be here um, and speaking at Crisis again. Um, always uh, a real pleasure to be connecting with uh, such uh, well-experienced individuals and also fellow panelists as well. So uh, good day to, to all of you. I think in, in, in the context of infrastructure or just investments in general for Asia, 
there naturally are lots of complexity, especially when the benchmark and the baseline of, of a lot of our investment behavior tend to be more, um, you know, uh, flexible uh, liquid markets uh, and, you know, very developed markets, especially OPEC countries. So it's very natural, I think, when we, we have that, that, that perspective to view Asia with a huge amount of complexity and perspectives that, you know, uh, sometimes uh, we, we don't actually uh, recognize it in nuances. That's it. There are um, great opportunities in Asia because we are at the cusp of development, economic development, where infrastructure is a great need. And not only um, it's not a, a good to have, right, it's a necessity and it is at a stage where it's getting to a, an overloaded situation where we, we just need to improve the infrastructure. The good news is that at, that, at this juncture, we get to choose infrastructure projects or even um, you know, startups who have the right technology that would take um, you know, Asia into a perspective of a cleaner, greener, even more resource efficient economy um, than you know, we used to have. And even that our uh, European and American counterparts are looking to develop into working with the baggage and the legacy of where they were before. So I think there is a great opportunity in that convergence where we are at this cusp of, you know, exploding towards this international development and at the same time being able to select technologically advanced perspectives on where we need to be. In terms of dealing with complexities and, and, and work itself, I think there are a couple of things that we just have to consider, maybe two or three uh, quick points. And then I'll love to hear, even I would love to hear from my co-panelists as well. Um, so the first is, um, you know, when, when we are deciding and in coming into Asia, we have to remember that, uh, say, for example, in Southeast Asia, just as a general rule of thumb, um, you know, uh, Singapore, Malaysia, um, maybe, say, you know, Commonwealth-based uh, um, you know, jurisdictions, but actually in Indonesia and Vietnam have very different interesting perspectives on the way that they do business. I think understanding nuance and understanding con contextualized needs within those different countries is a starting point. What I mean by it is legal ramifications, tax ramifications, and as well as for governments, how they need to also um, you know, recognize different you know, leading technology, for example. So for one thing, the second element is government. It's also how government is looking at their needs and how we're matching it up with the future needs of countries. A lot of governments have a lot of help from different um, uh, global uh, entities. But one of the things that we're, we're starting to see is them falling behind on technologically, um, you know, assessing different perspectives. So, for example, in Singapore, crypto is not part of the tax exemption for certain elements on funds. If you're looking at, say, parts of um, Southeast Asia on IP rights for alternative proteins, say from black soldier flies, they will come, uh, they have yet to recognize these different elements. And, you know, even um, trying to talk about IP being moved from different parts of Southeast Asia within the different countries have huge challenges. So for us, we spend a good amount of time talking to governments in uh, providing awareness and co-learning with them so that they can also keep policy just as uh, quick ahead of the curve as the markets are moving. And last of all is just recognizing that also the local context and demands as well of, of um, ASEAN, say, consumers are also shifting quite quickly. And keeping a, a, you know, abreast of that is a very critical element to really making sure that you're on trend and on the right investments as well. So I think I'll just leave it there. I know it's a bit general, but happy to jump in with more details later. Yeah, thanks very much, Leon. And I think we can pick up on a number of those points there in a moment. Certainly, um, you mentioned about sort of speaking to governments um, and the difference in context and, and the subtleties and the nuances. Um, I'm sure we can come back to those. But I'd like to introduce now our other panelist, Mr. Hiroyuki Onishi from Japan, uh, and maybe the same question to you. Um, you're the CEO of the Technology Seed Incubation Company, and you've had a lot of experience of guiding SMEs in the Japanese context, for example, and also I think the other way around. So w what about um, investors in your context? How can they be guided effectively under consideration of those regulations that we're speaking about in Japan. Would you like to comment on that, Mr. Onishi? 
Okay. Uh, thank you for introducing my, uh, me <coughs> about me and uh, I am pleasure to invite this meeting. Thank you. Uh, first, uh, 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 let me introduce myself uh, because our company's business style is very unique. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have 10 years experience of venture capital and 20 years experience of incubator, including managing small company of processing semiconductor, including R&D. Uh, uh, TSI is a subsidiary company of Social Impact Solutions Group. Uh, Social Impact Solutions Group is a business developing company group as our own business or so supporting startups in Japan, Asia, North Africa, and so on. For example, our business style are investing, establishing new companies, including investment as a co-founder, and making a joint company with startups of founders. We can do uh, these activities because main persons of S S uh, social impact solutions have over 20 years experiences in venture capital and incubator. Uh, as for TSI, we are supporting to connect between startups and big companies or SME and big companies because big companies are always trying to build new business around their business area. For example, we support Japanese companies that buy Asian companies and invest in startups. Uh, regarding acquisitions, especially the acquisitions of uh, Vietnamese companies because Vietnam is a growing market. In the old economy, uh, but in the old economy, Vietnamese companies like uh, Japanese companies because uh, they want to uh, catch the technology and uh, know-how. Uh, uh, currently, uh, one Japanese LPG providing company invested about uh, uh, 18 million US dollars in one Vietnamese listed LPG distributor company as a large stockholder. Regarding investment in startups, we introduced Taiwanese startups, especially medical devices, IoT, and AI companies to Japanese companies and investors as potential business partners. And from last year, we uh, collaborated with uh, uh, Institute for uh, Information Industry, that is one of Taiwanese gov government agencies. We had several business matching seminars. Uh, in those seminars, uh, startups are p pitching. And after pitching, startups and potential partners can have the meeting directly. Uh, about uh, Asian regulations, I introduced one case. Uh, one uh, uh, pharmaceutical company have acquired uh, Vietnamese companies. However, uh, since 100% foreign capital companies cannot sell medicines in Vietnam, so they are taking minority capital and establishing an import special specialist company to sell imported products. To hold. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Onishi. And that's a fascinating insight and a good start to this discussion. I'd like to introduce now um, our third guest, Dr. Mahesh Gandhi. Um, and uh, Dr. Gandhi is located in Germany, but has significant experience, of course, of the Indian context. Um, Mahesh Gandhi is the managing director of a company called Afi Capital, located in Germany. And Afi Capital focuses on structured project and trade finance solutions for infrastructure, with a particular focus 
uh, on sectors like the agro sector um, and industry in general. And I understand that, you know, you've done quite a few transportation projects already, Mahesh. So maybe we can also include those in a moment as um, examples. Mahesh is the co-founder and CEO and is active in advising SMEs, particularly SMEs, in investing in different sectors. And I've mentioned those already. So Mahesh, um, Dr. Mahesh Gandhi, maybe the question to you, we're just um, talking about um, Asian regulations. Um, and considering your experience as the managing director of AFI Capital, how can investors be guided under consideration of those Asian regulations? Over to you, Mahesh. Well, well thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, thank you for, of course, introducing me. It's, it's a great platform to be on. Uh, coming straight to the subject, uh, the regulations in most of these Asian economies, you know, I have more experience in the Indian subcontinent. So when we say the Indian subcontinent is India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and Nepal. So this is the region where I've done most of my work. Uh, the regulations uh, in these economies, uh, you know, it, it's the problem with investors is that when they want to come to these countries, they are advised in most cases by uh, local law firms in their own countries, which which is uh, you know often you know they they feel very comfortable. For example, someone coming from Japan would like to work with a Japanese law firm, who maybe has some partners in India, uh, uh, and uh, someone coming from Germany would do the same. Uh, another person coming from uh, USA would do the same. Uh, we what we have seen is that it's better to work with. Uh, with uh, with people who have real experience firsthand and not second hand that that's extremely important and it's also important that they should try to meet up with the people who matter on their own that really goes a long way uh, i'll give you an example so if 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 anybody wants to come and invest in in india for that matter yes you have law firms in your countries which of course can advise you on what is going on in India, but at the same time, it's extremely important for you to travel to India, go to Delhi, go to Bombay, meet up with the people on ground, meet up with the ministers and meet up with the administrators personally yourself. And then you will find that navigating those laws and navigating those regulations is not so challenging as it is made out to be. So we have had more success with people who were willing. I'm sorry, in these COVID times, it's become difficult to travel. But, uh, you know, but even then, uh, there is a way, there is a met method how you can reach out to these people. Uh, what we are doing sitting here in Germany is, of course, handholding some companies. When we do handholding, we, we don't direct them sitting over here. We take them there. We take them and put them across those people and clear their doubts. So regulations are more or less the same. These, these, these economies, especially, uh, they, they've sort of cut copy paste of the uh, the English law. It is it is uh, not something which is unique, so unique. Yes, of course, there would be some regulations which have been put in place for the purpose of protecting the environment, protecting the poor, protecting the. But that's standard and common everywhere. So we should not get scared of. Uh, the local regulation. There, there's no reason to be scared. There's nothing which is uh, a demonstrating somewhere in the cabinet is going to come out and you know catch hold of uh, the investors. That's not going to happen. Uh, but uh, I'm sorry, but the law firms do really make it look very difficult. It is not so difficult. Please come, go and meet the people, have the first-hand experience, and I'm sure you'll succeed. I have succeeded. In infrastructure, we invested over six six billion dollars in India. And uh, in all these investments that we made across sectors, uh, I was meeting people myself and very complicated issues. They get resolved when you sit across the table. Thank you. Mahesh, that's a good introduction. I think there's a common theme here about meeting up and with focusing on perhaps one particular stakeholder group, you know, the, the governments that um, actually 
uh, implement the regulations. And Leon, um, I'd like to come back to you because you mentioned sort of different contexts there. And you've got quite a lot of experience of various Asian contexts. And you kind of emphasize that often the understanding can be quite different. You mentioned the case of Indonesia, for example, with the black soldier fly and um, how things are going on there. Um, you said you, you also you, you like to speak to um, people as well about this. How do yes. you, kind of, and you mentioned education, you know, education of the different authorities. Um, could you maybe give us some exam an example of how that is actually um, guided by you and, and how you actually deal with that type of challenge? Mm -hmm. Yes. Particularly, uh, particularly during these COVID times, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And, you know, I have, I, and uh, welcome to Mahesh as a, a fellow panelist. And I, I would definitely agree with Mahesh as well that, you know, especially in the Asian context, you got to be on the ground and, um, and a lot of uh, deals do um, end up being a face to face where you can really get through and understand the context as well. And not, not to mention, especially for, you know, myself, I may be English speaking, but, you know, we still go down to the ground. We, sp we speak Bahasa, for example, in Indonesia, and we have partners who are there who also speak the local context. Um, speaking a language is one thing, understanding the context and the, the constraints that many people are under, especially in an imperfect regulation space where they are not designed specifically for the types of businesses that they are looking to built for the future. So I think having those conversations and being able to spend the time to explain for them to also give us the time is already quite an honor for them to make the time to learn and want to learn from us. So for example, you know, we made a, a early stage investment into um, waste management and supply chain uh, food management and how we're trying to reduce waste, uh, food waste in places like Indonesia and the Indonesian government actually came down uh, from parliament, from the research side, to come meet with the company as well. And that, I think, is an interesting sign that tr they themselves are also trying to engage and understand these different complexities and challenges. And it, it's it always interesting and nice when we always end conversations with you know, perspectives of what else is needed to make sure that this, this industry you know, succeeds. So I think them coming in and wanting to understand is really, really good. For us to be able to be given the opportunity to explain what those needs are is also pretty good. And then last of all, almost to what Mahesh says, um, you know, having a foreign lawyer versus a local lawyer and also for you to go down and understand why certain steps are there, uh, being able to um, understand why things are crafted in a certain way, why, why there's certain steps in the process, is um, sometimes seems tedious, but actually are there for very legitimate reasons as well, whether we like it or not, right? So it's really just being able to appreciate that and then being able to apply ourselves in it, in, in those shoes, and then say, okay, you know, how do we overcome these different elements as well? And then, and, and for me, being on the ground and connecting with people, it's always better and easier that way especially when there is already a starting language barrier to begin with. So I, I think that those are the few elements that definitely um, cuts through a lot of those um, um, you know, issues and allows us to also be upfront about our needs and what we're looking for. And hopefully through that process, the goal is then for us to not only speed things up, but also have in place the right needs as well. So one of the things that we, we learned the hard way was also certain, uh, for example, if we're in, you know, a logistics business in Indonesia, um, having environmental certification in certain other areas uh, was never really seen as necessary, but was actually by regulation necessary. So trying to understand all those different elements sometimes, um, yeah, it, it's not natural, but I think it's necessary. And so those engagements are uh, truly important. I, I hope that, that covers the bit, uh, Peter. Excellent, Leon. And um, I think now we're getting down to specifics. We've had sort of a, a general introduction, answer this sort of a, a general question about regulation. And I think, uh, Mr. Onishi, you were also highlighting an example. Um, you mentioned um, Vietnam, I understand, and, and your experience there. Would you like to um, perhaps um, explain a little bit more what your company is doing in that respect? And 
and how you're guiding companies. Is that possible to, to explain a little bit more, particularly during these challenging times? We've emphasized the fact that you know face-to-face -face meetings are often really essential, particularly in specific Asian contexts, but it is challenging. How, how are you dealing with those challenges there, um, particularly in maybe a market like you mentioned, Vietnam? Oh, okay. Uh, in this uh, COVID-19, uh, it is difficult to uh, <coughs> to have the meeting. <coughs> Sorry, to have the meeting uh, face to face by face to face. But uh, mm, but uh, uh, in uh, in uh, LPG gas case, company's case, uh, before COVID uh, nineteen. Uh, they, they had, uh, uh, Japanese companies, uh, key persons went to Vietnam, uh, to have the meeting, uh, and, uh, and go to the factory. Um, uh, and after, uh, after starting, uh, COVID-19, uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, we had a lot of uh, online meeting uh, because uh, we must uh, understand uh, both uh, business uh, style, uh, business feeling, behavior, and uh, enthusiasm. Uh, so, um, so. Um, we uh, so maybe there uh, uh, we spend uh, spent uh, one point half year to understand the boss, uh, but uh, no. So uh, so uh, we can. Uh, so I think uh, we can. Uh, uh, Jap uh, so I think Japanese companies, ja Japanese company can. Uh, invest uh, uh, LPG's company, uh, and uh, uh, I want to say uh, it is the, uh, it is important uh, to um, regulation of uh, of the country, for example, Vietnam. Uh, but the uh, most important thing uh, is uh, um, the company's talent and uh, uh, philosophy uh, and passion. I think so. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Onishi. Um, I'd like to, and um, maybe we could pick up on some of those points uh, in a moment. I'd like to come on to a, a second question. Um, and that is regarding um, sort of um, opportunities and maybe some of the risks, um, particularly relating to investment. Um, and a, a general question of, um, you know, are investors really using gut feelings uh, when they go forward now? Or is there, um, is there a little bit more than that? Maybe you could comment on that, Mahesh, in the context of also uh, your examples that you've um, you've guided in the Indian context. So is it sort of a um, gut feeling investment or is it, is it, should it be more than that? Perhaps you could comment a bit on that in respect of your uh, experience and work. You're on, you're on mute, I'm sorry. Thanks, Peter. I, 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 I've been known to be one of the most impulsive investors. So uh, if you are impulsive, then obviously you go with your gut feeling. But uh, at the end of the day, we must know that for managing private investment risks, there are reasonable methods available. Not just uh, navigation on the legal side, which we discussed just now, but uh, also on the financial side. Now I'll take, I'll give you an example. In fact, I'll, I would like to like to give you two examples uh, on the infrastructure side. Uh, uh, you must have seen several toll projects. You know, there's a toll collection which has to happen. There's a the revenue collection which has to happen on ground. 
Now, collection of revenue from people, from, from ordinary people, has always been one of the most challenging and daunting tasks. And it's a huge risk. So toll risk is one risk which uh, always has been like, you know, top of the mind of anyone investing in infrastructure. Now, how to manage that risk? Uh, governments have been allowing and supporting various annuity programs. There's, there's a minimum guarantee, et cetera, et cetera. So there are certain uh, methods available as far as contracts are concerned. But when we go down, when we go on, on ground and we visit the site, we uh, look at the traffic studies, we are able to manage that risk, uh, you know, using local people, using local staff, using local contractors, trying to see, okay, how many units are going to be passing this particular toll uh, where, where we are collecting the revenue. Or when we were collecting revenue in a water project, I'll give you an example. We were collecting uh, water revenue in a small town in India uh, where you know we were, we, were, we were responsible for issuing the uh, bills, we were supplying water, we were distributing water, but then we have to also collect. Now you can't you can't go to a village and you can't go to someone's house and say, okay, I'm disconnecting your water connection because you haven't paid for the last three months. You can't do that. So this is this is a big risk. People don't pay. So when people don't pay, there there are other methods and other method, you know uh, uh, ways to uh, cover this. Now I, that's why I want to get back to two institutional support systems. One support system you will be speaking about Japan. Uh, JBIC is one of the large institutions in Japan, which supports investments. So whenever we have this kind of a risk, this kind of a risk is a kind of a quasi-political risk, you know, social risk, the collection of revenue on ground. There are insurance structures available where they will give you an insurance to cover that risk. So if for some reason you're not able to recover and the government is not able to help you, then obviously this insurance comes in to support me. Of course, who supports JBIC is a separate issue. How they recover is a separate issue. I'm talking about the private investment risk. So as a private investor, I'm covered. Going from Germany, if I'm making an investment from Germany to India, I use Yola Hermes. Yola Hermes is able to give me a proper insurance covering my investment risk into India. So my political risk and other risks are covered. So while A, we need to actually go on ground and coordinate with the local contractors and the local people there who can help us cover and mitigate those risks. At the same time, these kinds of arrangements are available. JPEG and Yola Hermes are two examples. But then UKEF does the same. Sachi does the same. KSHO does the same. Uh, you have, uh, uh, you know, now the BPI in France does the same. So you have several institutions all over the world who are there to support private investors if they are wanting to invest in this country. So we just have to identify the risks, try to mitigate them ourselves to, to the best of our ability. But then we are able to also depend and rely on these global multilateral institutions who are there to help us. Whatever they are doing is under the OECD program. And the OECD program is well known. Uh, you know, uh, there's, there's, there are very transparent regulations. And we always can take help on that. Thank you, Mahesh. Um, and maybe we could stay on that topic of mitigating risk. Again, you emphasize that, you know, the importance of being on the ground and knowing the local context. Leon, how do you see that whole sort of question of risks and, and what you're doing in your organization, Amazon Capital, to, to mitigate those risks? Is that something that you could um, provide any advice on? I, I think, um, you know, uh, Jetro, for example, with Japan, you know, it, it, these partners will always definitely be helpful as, as government agencies who are encouraging um, you know, direct investments. So definitely there will be resources available. Um, I think that we, we should take a step back in, in context again, you know, with uh, in comparison to OECD countries, what kind of risk profile would you be looking for? And the risk profile that we essentially work on and we, we have to be cognizant about is the gap between what can be mitigated and what risk is remaining and what kind of uncertainty is there. And that uncertainty and, and, and risk that is outlaid that, that, for example, may not be able to be mitigated fully you know, we need to understand um, that that um, threshold 
needs to adjust itself, <laughs> you know, regardless of how much mitigation you put at the table. And that, that's the, um, the joy in, and also the uncertainty of playing and working and investing in Asia as well, right? I think uh, especially in a space where we're investing on trend for, you know, much longer horizons, anywhere between five to 10 years, for example, and we cannot, you know, be very clear about all these different um, uh, areas of uh, risk. Mitigation it obviously will come through uh, these different resources and partnerships, and in addition with our um, you know teams on the ground who understand uh, the different elements. And I think, especially in Asia, we've um, had to develop due diligence um, proxies, which are very creative. <laughs> and uh, you know, there's a difference between actually seeing the you know piece of paper versus actually seeing what you you see in person. And uh, also trying to understand certain elements of, you know, why, you know, for example, if, if we're looking at certain agreements, we have to make the, the first plunge in in the Greenfield project, even before some of the regulatory risk have been um, either mitigated or even the governments have come up uh, through it, because we know that these are definitely needs and technology and infrastructure um, projects that definitely um will be needed in, in the future. And of obviously with uh, some level of um, wisdom, practical wisdom, we've got to be clear about, you know, certain ESG risk to begin with already. So I think for us, how we, we tackle it is obviously trying to manage um, the future needs and necessity for technology and the infrastructure. Add it together with where the different risks are and what is acceptable appetite of exposure and then finally, then being able to to say, how do we mitigate through uh, time horizons? But more importantly, also uh, be able to wrap our head around different interesting proxies of figuring out whether the risk is going to be mitigated uh, in, the, in the longer run. So that, I think that that's how, how we've been looking at it um, in, in a broad sense in, in that way. Thank you very much indeed, Leon. And that's uh, um, highly appreciated that... Um those comments. Maybe back to you, Mr. Anishi, and also risks. You know, we, we've heard um, from the two other speakers and we've heard mention of the Japanese um, sort of guidance there at a high level. Um, how are, uh, would you like to comment on, on risks and, and mitigation of risk, risks in the areas that you're working in, please? Okay, uh, for example, in Vietnam, uh, we can support Japanese companies to expand the Vietnam into Vietnam because, um, because we, um, because two years ago, uh, we established, uh, one, uh, some, uh, one, Vietnamese uh, investing company, uh, uh, Vietnam, uh, investing company to Viet Vietnamese startups with uh, three, uh, three, uh, three, uh, three persons who they uh, manage uh, real their own business. So, uh, so we can support, uh, investing, uh, support that Japanese companies, uh, uh invest or, uh, go to business, uh, go to, uh, business in Vietnam. And, uh, and, uh, M&A advisory field, uh, we, uh, we collaborate with, uh, uh, three uh, Vietnamese uh, advisor and business partner uh, in Ho Chi Minh and Hanoi, and they uh, they are uh, they are uh, around twenty experience uh, in Vietnam uh, M and A uh, area from Japan or EU. So we can support Japanese companies. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much indeed, gentlemen, for this fascinating discussion so far. Um, maybe we could, we focused on sort of general things now. And we did actually, we know that, um, you know, some of the most challenging parts of our society will be the poor and the socially 
um, not so well off. And Leon, um, I'd like to sort of just, you know, ask you about your experience there, because we did start, you, you've got experience of impact investment and social entrepreneurship. How do you see that kind of, um, you know, group of people and um, any kind of um, context um, that you could provide us with? You know, we were talking about sort of fairly macro level things, but particularly good examples. But what about, you know, um, impact when we're talking about social impact? The biggest um, challenges often in these Asian contexts have been amongst the poorer. So your organization and you, I think, have got quite a bit of experience in that context. Any any comments in that respect? Mm. So I, I think as a, as a background, and maybe let, let's define this effectively, right? ESG is a, a form of negative and positive screening for companies itself. For us, we reckon that impact investing is a lot more than that. It's a deliberate, intrinsic nature of a startup company that is designing a business model that will not only drive financial outcomes, but drive measurable and tangible outcomes in social uh, and environment. So, for example, um, our um, logistics company in Indonesia actually hires deliberately and actively uh, scouts for adults, um, uh, you know, um, a youth with um, who are marginalized, youth with some level of physical disability who have been marginalized through the process and need further support. We do a hiring process, and the business in itself is carbon neutral in the sense that we don't burn any fossil fuels through the process of a last mile delivery. Now, in, in this element, we they started because intrinsically they wanted to change up a polluting industry and also support jobs for people in need. I think what COVID has done through this period in the last two years has highlighted the disparity between those who have and those who don't have. In addition, as well, it's it's highlighted a lot of the challenges of what if, you know, and what happens when people don't have a safety net and don't have any other options. And I think that when we are, what COVID has done and the magic of it is also helped us understand and I and see with very, very clear vision where those challenges lie in poverty, environment, and how it's affecting people. So I think going forward, what we are expecting, at least in Southeast Asia, is that any form of investment, whether in the infrastructure, the startup, or even technology space, will have a very deep-seated perspective on social elements and environmental elements of how it helps, and not just be about how do we make the money and get the GDP on it, but how do we actually ensure that our GDP growth is inclusive for these people with those needs. And I think that's going to be one of the biggest um, you know, shifts in policy regulators who are already asking it. And I'm really, really happy that they are doing that already um, and making it more clear of the expectations of how we're using GDP, using business to really affect those changes. That's excellent, Leon. And um, there would be more to speak about in terms of detail, but maybe quickly, Mahesh, because I think we're coming to the end. Um, any comments on that? You know, we're talking about the sort of social, um, we've got this sort of extreme situation with um, uh, those that are wealthy. Um, yeah, yeah. And unfortunately, those that have um, really lost out, particularly because of the, the pandemic. Any comments, particularly in the absolutely, Indian context? Absolutely. absolutely. Uh, Peter, uh, traditionally, uh, you know, when Adam Smith defined economics as, uh, you know, it was all about money, 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 money. <laughs> it's still there. It's still there. So as uh, when, when I'm uh, implementing, uh, uh, you know, social uh, aspects of uh, business and I'm reviewing that, there are two parts to it. One is what we implement and what we achieve through what we call CSR. So there is a CSR activity which is which is there in the system. And right now, uh, for example, in India, it is mandatory to invest 3% of your profits towards CSR. So any company anywhere in India has to mandatorily invest 3% 3, 3 of their profits towards CSR. This is one. Second, 
what are they really trying to achieve through uh, so-called impact uh, uh, investments? Now, impact investments, I, I can give you one example, uh, two examples, actually. There is one project in which we have co-invested in India uh, where uh, stuffs, you know, the, the usual stuff, uh, smokeless stuffs are being manufactured and sold to, uh, distributed to uh, Africa, people, people in Africa. Now, the cost of this uh, manufacturing, this stuff is around uh, $30. But uh, we are distributing it for one dollar. So twenty nine dollars. You now we are spending. Interestingly, my business is still making money. How? Because as an investor, I know how to manage it. What we are doing is we have uh, valued the carbon credits on it. How we are, you know, supporting impact uh, stories in Africa how it is helping people gain employment, how it is helping people save their health because now there's no smoke. So then they don't have that problems, those health problems. So there has been a valuation. So when we have valued the carbon credits and the impact on, on, the, on, the, on the people, what we found that each stuff that we were uh, manufacturing and selling there, uh, there's a profit now of around $12 per stuff, even when I'm giving it out for $1. The profit is delayed. I'm going to get it after two years or three years, you know, over a period of time. But that's no problem. But yes, we will make money on it. So it's not just impact today for businessmen. I'm a businessman. I, 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 I don't feel bad saying that I, I'm here to make money. But uh, yes, but even when I'm making money, I want to be careful about the society. I want to take care of the people. I want to make sure that, yes, we do a lot of impact investment. And all this impact investment, ultimately, for a private investor, it is going to be profit. It is not a loss situation. So we That's don't have to do a CSR in everything. We, yes, of course, we are socially responsible. So yeah. my 3%, as of now, I'm proud to say that we are investing 5.5% of our annual revenues. Not 3%. Very good. We That's are investing 55 in CSR. But at the same time, we are making money. And I don't feel bad about it. I'm sorry. Fascinating. We can go on a lot, I think, about impact investment. And I think, Leon, um, you've got some excellent points. But the measurement is also another topic that we could have yes. touched on. And sustainability, you know, you mentioned, you know, the, the big day and long term. But I think, gentlemen, um, we start <laughs> streaming now. Um, so it's actually um, our time's up. I'd like to thank you all because I found this discussion fascinating. Um, it was really, uh, we, we started off fairly um, high level with global comments, but I think we really did touch on some very excellent examples. And I'd like to thank you and for providing those. And I hope our audience has enjoyed listening to the different experts, um, really fantastic advice on the different contexts. We've covered uh, many different countries, many different Asian contexts. So thank you all and wishing you every success uh, for your activities, um, and protect, particularly now we're coming to the end of the year almost, all best for 2022, and hopefully it's going to be not so challenging. Hopefully we are not so, in lockdown. I don't know what <laughs> we hope to be able to move around a little bit more freely because we did actually emphasize that face-to-face -face component is so important. So, um, Mr. Nishi, thank you very much indeed to you from Japan. Uh, Leon, thank you very much indeed to you. Uh, I think you're in Singapore, aren't you? Yes, <laughs> from I'm Singapore. Not Great. <laughs> Last time I spoke to you, it was in the States, I think. Um, thank you, Leon. And thank you, Mahesh, in Germany. Um, we're thankfully on the same time zone. So so. <laughs> Great. Wonderful to have you. I, I love Singapore. Uh, Leon, I, I lived there for nearly seven years. Please. So.